Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. In today's video, we're gonna explore quantum computing. So first of all, we're gonna have a bit of an introduction as to the difference between a classical computer and a quantum computer. And then at the end, uh, we're gonna have a bit of an example of how to program these things using uh, both a simulator and a real quantum computer. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to say a big, big thank you to all of my Patreons. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel and become a patron, head over to Patreon, uh, or you could purchase some merchandise from the store below. All right, so first of all, in order to understand what a quantum computer is and how it's different from a classical computer, we have to define what a classical computer is. All of the computing devices that we use day to day, this is our laptop computers or our um, smartphones, our tablets, even things like our microwave ovens, they're all classical computers and they all run on bits. So a bit or a binary digit can be any one of two states. Now it can either be zero or off, or it can be one or on, in other words. So there's not a great deal that you can do with a single bit. You can either set it to zero or one and then you can read it later on. But interesting things start to happen when we get a couple of these bits together. So if we've got two bits and each of them can be set to zero or one, then there's actually four different possibilities. So we could set the bits to either zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And if you're familiar with programming and computing, you'd probably be aware that this is kind of how computers count. And in short, the more bits that you add, then the more different possible states that you could set your bits to. So what the CPU actually does, it has some very basic logic, which uh, allows it to do um, simple arithmetic, things like adding two bytes together or subtracting two bytes, multiplying bytes or dividing bytes. Anyway, the important thing about the way that a classical computer works is if you set a byte in your classical computer, say to five, which in binary is 101, then if you read that byte later on, it's just going to say 5. There's no ambiguity at all. Yeah, you set the bits in a byte or you set a byte to a number, it's always going to be that. Every one of those trillions of bits in the hard drives and in the memory and even in the CPU itself, every single one of those bits is set to either 0 or 1 and there is no ambiguity at all. Yeah, so that's a, a classical computer, but uh, wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be fun if instead of setting a bit to zero or one with no ambiguity, wouldn't it be fun if we could say something like there's a 50% chance of zero and there's a 50% chance of one. So instead of saying our bit is definitely zero or our bit is definitely one, we could just say it's 50-50. Yeah, and then when we run our program, our program could choose. So if we ran our program three times using this strange little random bit, then it might come out with uh, one, one, zero, 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 or it might have uh, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Yeah, or one, 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 something like that. Yeah, but every time we run our program, there's a 50% chance that when we read our bit, it will be zero, and there's a 50% chance that when we read our strange little bit, it will be one. Okay, well we know that normal bits don't work like that. Normal bits are just zero or one. There's no ambiguity, you just set them to zero or one. So instead of calling this strange little random bit a bit, let's call it a qubit, shall we? So our qubit is like a normal bit, except instead of setting it to zero or one with certainty, we can set it kind of in between. We can say there's a 50-50 probability that it's gonna come up either zero or one. So it's pretty much just the same as flipping a coin, the way that we've defined our little qubit at the moment. Yeah, so if you flip a coin, you can get heads or you can get tails. And one of the important things about it to note is that there's 100% probability that you'll get one of the two. So whenever you flip a coin, you're not gonna get in between heads or tails, you're gonna get one or the other. Likewise, for our little qubit, when we read the qubit, it's always going to say that it's uh, selected zero or it's selected one. Okay, so that's kind of interesting idea. Uh, a qubit that can be zero or one with 50-50 probability, but uh, it would be more interesting, I think, uh, if instead of 50-50 probability, what if we could play around with those probabilities just a little bit? So something like a biased coin, yeah, if you've, uh, if you've got a biased coin, maybe it comes up heads 25% of the time and maybe it's biased towards tails and it comes up tails 75% of the time. So maybe our qubit could do the same. Maybe we could make our qubit biased towards one. Yeah, so that 75% of the time it comes out with a one and the remaining 25% of the time it comes out with a zero. So that way, if we ran our program 100 times, we'd start to see the pattern emerge 
um, we'd start to see approximately 75% of the runs, we would have a one returned from our program when we read our qubit and approximately 25% of the time, our qubit would say it's zero. Maybe we could just set these probabilities to anything we like, being careful that the probabilities do add up to 100%, since our qubit has to be either zero or one when we come to read it. So we'll take our coin analogy a little bit further, and if you flip two coins, then there's four possibilities. You could get tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, or heads, heads. So if our program returned two of these little random qubits that were both selecting whether they're zero or one, uh, if they were fair, if they were unbiased, then we would have a 25% chance of our program returning zero, zero from our two qubits. We would have a 25% chance of our program returning zero, one, a 25% chance of our program returning one, zero, and a 25% chance of our program returning one, one. Now that's if our qubits are fair, but it would be very interesting, as we said before, if we could bias our qubits. What if we could bias each of these four probabilities? Uh, we could say there's a 16% chance that the qubits will return 0, 0. We could say there's a 42% chance that the qubits will return 0, 1. We could assign a 31% chance that they'll return 1, 0. And we could assign an 11% chance that they'll return 1, 1. So we can actually set pretty much any probability that we want, really. Any of the four probabilities to any of these little states so long as it sums up to 100%, we could run our little program and our little probabilistic qubits will spit out, I don't know, one zero with some probability. Yeah, that'd be really, really interesting. So we can set uh, four different probabilities. One probability for each of the possible states that our qubits could return. Uh, this is starting to turn into quite a strange program. Now, it mightn't come too much as uh, a surprise, but uh, qubits are what quantum computers use instead of bits. Yeah, they, uh, they actually use these things, and, and this is pretty much how they work. So there's a couple of really, really interesting things about real qubits, uh, aside from coins. And we do have to go into that, because this is really what gives quantum computers their power. First of all, a qubit in a quantum computer, just like a classical bit, when you read the value of it, it's going to say 0 or 1, with no ambiguity. Uh, but unlike a classical bit, a qubit can be in this probabilistic state, this state in between zero and one, where there's say a 50% chance that it's zero and a 50% chance that it's one. And then what we have to do is actually read the qubit to make it decide which state it wants to be in. So what's really interesting about this, um, as we saw just before, uh, when we move from one qubit, we had to assign two probabilities. We said like it's 50-50 or it's 25 to 75. And then when we moved on to two qubits, we saw that there's now four possible states. So if we want to completely describe the system of uh, probabilities there, what we have to supply is four probabilities. So two qubits can imply four probabilities as we saw just before. Uh, something like eight qubits, could imply uh, 256 probabilities. So you start to see now that the amount of probabilistic data that these things are holding at any one time is, uh, is exponential and it grows very, very fast. Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking something like, why can't we just get a classical computer to randomly select numbers? Uh, we, we can, yeah, but there's something there's something absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing uh, about the uh, qubits and the way that they do this strange probabilistic thing. No, this is really, I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is stranger than fiction, really. This is, this is, it's magic, it's magic. Before we read the value of a qubit, it's in both states at once. So these probabilistic states that we've been talking about with our qubits, they're called superpositions. And this is a phenomena of quantum physics. And it's really, really, really strange. Uh, they call this sort of stuff quantum weirdness. And I tell you what, it's absolutely fascinating. Before we read the qubit, while it's in that superposition, uh, it doesn't have a zero or one. Like a coin, while it's spinning through the air, is actually flipping from heads to tails over and over again. A qubit's not like that. Uh, the qubit superposition is actually zero and one at the same time. It's both at the same time. So in quantum physics, they talk about the collapse of the wave function. So there's a lot of things that collapse the wave function or reduce this superposition to a classical state. 
um, if you read the value of your qubit, it stops being magical altogether. So it stops being zero and one at the same time, it just picks one. It basically pretends that it wasn't doing anything strange the whole time and just says, well, I'm, I'm one. Mm. So this is really the crucial point. This is what differentiates a quantum computer from a classical one. This is why quantum computers are said to be able to compute things that classical computers cannot. When we read the value of a qubit, it's gonna say that it's zero or one, exactly the same as a classical computer. But the crucial part is, before we read it, while the qubit is in a superposition of zero and one, it's both values at the same time. So to understand why uh, quantum superpositions are something wholly different from classical uh, computers, say randomly selecting numbers, uh, I think it's very helpful to imagine a maze. Yeah, so a classical computer just runs down some path, checks if it works out, and if it doesn't, it runs down another path. A classical computer just checks one path at a time. Uh, if there's a lot of paths, if the maze is quite complicated, then you could imagine that the computer might have to search thousands or millions of different paths before it actually finds the exit. So with a classical computer randomly selecting a different path at each junction, it might accidentally choose the wrong path every time. I mean, we might run this thing and it might go on for a thousand years before the computer actually finds the way out of the maze. So that's what a classical computer is like when a classical computer uh, tries to mimic something like a quantum computer randomly choosing bits. So if there's a lot of paths, then the chances that a classical computer will accidentally happen upon the correct path, the chances are almost 0%. I mean, it's gonna take a lot of runs through this algorithm before the classical computer accidentally finds the correct path. So with a quantum computer and qubits, what we can actually do is set our qubits to all paths at once. And then the objective in quantum computing is not so much um, check one path at a time like a classical computer, but to check all paths at once and then amplify any of the paths that actually make it to the end. This is a crucial difference. Uh, this is what superpositions allow us to do. Uh, if the qubits were truly not in a superposition, uh, if they were just choosing a random number like a classical computer does and checking one path at a time, then we wouldn't have the option to amplify the correct path. So it's crucial to understand that what the quantum computer does here is very, very different from a classical computer just choosing um, random zeros and ones or a coin flipping. The quantum computer is in all states at once. So really, the trickiest trick, the difficult part of all of this is actually figuring out how to program these things, figuring out the steps to amplifying the path in the maze like we just saw. Uh, it's not easy to do, and uh, all of this stuff is very, very new. I mean, this is a whole new world, a new frontier of computing is opening up. So that, in a nutshell, is a simple explanation of the way that qubits differ from classical bits and uh, the way that quantum computers differ from classical computers. So another interesting point about modern quantum computing is, is decoherence. So a lot of what we've talked about today is theoretically perfect. I mean, it works in theory, and we hope that we can develop quantum computers to do that. But the reality is that um, quantum computers at the moment actually have a lot of error in them. And when you've got your qubits in some detailed superposition, uh, almost anything at all threatens to actually read the qubits and make them collapse to a classical state before the computation is actually finished. So anything from, uh, from, from a little bit of heat coming in, or maybe a photon could come in and hit your qubits and read them, uh, it's crazy really. But this is why quantum computers at the moment pretty much take up a whole room or a whole cupboard. Yeah, so the chip itself is just a little like that kind of thing. The rest of the system is, uh, is cooling. It's a gigantic refrigerator. So the entire field is brand new and I think, I think very soon it's about to explode. Okay, so for this final part, the really fun part, I just wanna show a quantum computer simulator and then uh, a real quantum computer that we can program from, uh, from our desktop computers. Okay, so you'll see on the screen at the moment, this is a Quirk. Now this is a quantum computer simulator. So it's actually gonna be running on your um, regular classical computer. Uh, the, the first screen that you're greeted with here shows a couple of the interesting algorithms that are pre-programmed in this thing. Now, we don't have time really to go into a lot of this stuff, but um, Grover's Search 
and uh, Shaw's period finding, that's a very famous quantum algorithm. So you can select one of those if you want to start out with a template, but we might just uh, hit escape to get rid of that. And uh, uh, okay, so what you're greeted with is a screen something like this. So this is called a quantum circuit. Now, uh, just for small programs, just for research and a bit of fun exploring uh, qubits and quantum computing, um, these quantum circuits are really, really interesting. So there's two qubits over the side here. Uh, they're both set to zero. Uh, we can talk about bra cat notation in the future. Uh, that's the strange little box that it's in. Um, and over this side here, you'll see that at the moment, they're both off. So off and off. And you'll also see that there's uh, spheres here with uh, it's pointing upwards. Yeah, we can have a look at that in another video as well. That's actually a block sphere. So a couple of things that we can do, uh, just play around a little bit. Um, we could turn our quantum bits or our qubits on just by putting a powerly not gate there. Yeah, similar to uh, classical computers, you can just knot them if you want. Uh, something else we can do, we can make an AND gate. So we could say this one and this one are on, then not this one. Um, I'll explain all of these uh, gates and operations in a different video, I think. It's just uh, too long to cram it all into one video, but uh, this is an AND gate. And this third bit here should turn on when we've got both of these first two on. Let's have a look. Okay, one and zero gives you zero or off. Uh, zero and one gives you zero or off. But if we pally x gate this one, uh, one and one gives you one or on and on gives you on. Uh, okay, so that's pretty interesting. If we just clear our circuit for a second. Okay, so the superpositions that we were talking about before, that's actually the Hadamard gate. So if we just drag an H down here, you'll see that the quirk simulator actually represents that by saying 50%. So that means there's a 50% chance that when we read our qubit, it will be one and a 50% chance that it will be zero. So this is just a simulator. It's gonna be running on your laptop or your desktop PC. And uh, it can deal with up to about, I think it's about 30 qubits. Yeah, before it runs out of um, processing power. Yeah, but the Quirk Simulator. So there'll be a link in the video description for the Quirk Simulator. You go over and have a bit of a look. Interesting stuff. The other really interesting thing that we can do is go over to IBM's Quantum Experience. Uh, so IBM has actually set up a bunch of real quantum computers and you can actually make a little quantum circuit and then send it to one of these quantum computers. Uh, so this is the IBM Quantum Experience and once again, we don't have time in this video to go through exactly what all of this stuff means, but uh, it's good fun. So what we might do just as a final little uh, demonstration is um, cause a superposition on a real qubit. Let's do that, shall we? Uh, IBM Quantum Experience, give us a circuit, mate. I'm gonna say a new circuit, please. And we might save it, super. Position. Um, okay, so once again, we're greeted with a quantum circuit similar to Quirk. Um, the Q's over here, this little bra cat notation is telling us that they're all zero at the moment. So the IBM Quantum Experience, the same as the Quirk simulator, if you want a superposition, then you want a Hadamard gate. So we'll just drag this H for Hadamard. We'll drag him down here to qubit number zero. And the next thing that we've got to do is read our qubit. Uh, that's the little measurement tool just there in the IBM Quantum Experience. Uh, all right, so we've just caused a superposition. This qubit number zero just here is gonna be zero and one at the same time. And then we're gonna read it. So it's gonna figure out one of them, zero or one. And that I reckon is just about all we've gotta do for this demonstration. Uh, okay, so when you click run in the IBM Quantum Experience, you'll find that you've got a bunch of options here. Uh, one of which is actually a simulator. Yeah, but we won't use a simulator for today. What we might do is choose a real quantum computer. Uh, I always liked Burlington. I liked Burlington. Okay, so Burley, Burley, Burlington forever. Um, all right, so we've got Burlington, 1,024 shots. So this is actually gonna run our little quantum circuit 1,024 times. And uh, then it's gonna get back to us with the results. Yeah, it's gonna tell us which bits the um, qubit actually chose, zero or one. Anyway, we click run and off it goes to Burlington. Uh, I might just pause there because this can take some time. Okay, so Burlington has finished now, performing uh, its running of our little circuit 1,024 times. Let's see what it discovered, shall we? Uh, so it took about seven seconds to run it. Uh, sometimes, just because of the way that real qubits are connected together, um, you'll find that the program has to be translated a little bit. Yeah, so that can actually lead to quite a bit of error. Uh, but in our case, it's pretty much exactly as we wrote it. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see the results. Here we go. 
Okay, so we had our superposition qubit and it was read 1024 times and this is what happened. 50.391% um, of the time our little qubit was zero and 49.609% of the time our little qubit just here was one. So we actually caused uh, a real superposition there. Yeah, good fun. So there's uh, obviously a lot of exploring that you can do with the quantum simulator quirk and also a lot of uh, exploring that you can do with IBM's quantum experience and I'll leave a link to both of them down below in the video description. Uh, really good fun. Go over and have a bit of a look. Okay, interesting stuff. Quantum computing. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope that was uh, interesting and I want you to have a really good day.